Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI techniques, can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. All right, so um, I'm here with Michael Schwartz. He is the founder of Microsleep LLC and the program director for the Clinical Sleep Health Program at the Oregon Institute of Technology. Uh, Michael has over 30 years of experience uh, of experience in sleep. He's a registered and licensed sleep technologist, and he's certified in clinical sleep health. So. First of all, you do have a lot of experience in the field of sleep. How did you get involved in sleep? Well, let's see. I came out of college with a degree in psychology, and I do remember them talking a little bit about sleep in a couple psychology classes, which I think is kind of interesting because we always hear in medical school that they don't really talk much about sleep. Um, but I, I, I remembered a little bit of it and thought it was really interesting and then didn't think much of it after that. Then I got out of college and was doing odd jobs in the summer, and I was actually painting a house. And the person who, whose house I was painting was the best friend of a manager of a local sleep lab. And the lady stuck her head out the window and said, hey, Mike, are you a night person? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, there's a job as a sleep technician down the road. Are you interested? One thing led to another, and I was hired on to work nights in a sleep lab. So then I was running a big stainless steel polygraph machine with a Z-fold paper. And then that was in the mid to late eighties and started off down in Southern California and then just went on from there. Great. So, um, now you do a lot of work, especially you still do a lot of the sleep apnea work, but you also do a lot of work with insomnia as well. Right. So how did you kind of branch out from doing this sleep lab work into insomnia? Well, I, with a background in psychology, I was kind of familiar with, um, some of the aspects of insomnia and it was just kind of always a bit of an interest of mine. And when I eventually made my way up to Oregon in the 1990s, um, there was a medical director of the sleep lab where I was in um, who was a pulmonologist and was actually quite interested in chronic insomnia. And so we started talking and one thing led to another and he worked it out where I could educate patients. And so I would provide sleep education. and that's really how I started working with patients in a hospital setting who had primarily chronic insomnia. A large number of them had uh, comorbid sleep apnea. So it was kind of a combination type of patient that I was, was, I was educating. And it was mostly sleep hygiene, but there were, uh, there was some of the other components that um, are a little more helpful for chronic insomnia that I was allowed to phrase in my own way with the support of the medical director. So I felt, I felt, I felt very fortunate because it was a very interesting um, way to get into the field for me. Mm -hmm. So on a, on a typical week now, um, like roughly how many people with insomnia are, are you seeing, are you working with? I probably, I probably start with about four or five new um, clinical patients with chronic insomnia. Um, I often see them over the course of a month, about three different times. Um, and then in my online work, I might just see, you know, a couple a month. It's kind of a side thing um, mm. that I do for um, actual kind of sleep coaching. So um, primarily in, uh, in a clinical setting where I see patients with sleep, with, uh, sleep disorders, including chronic insomnia. Mm -hmm. So like me, you are a true believer in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, these techniques. Um, how, how did you progress from sleep hygiene onto CBTI in particular? And why, why is it that you think CBTI is so effective for chronic insomnia? Well, it really, you know, it really gets down to what is hygiene. Hygiene is something you do to prevent something. So if someone is in front of you and they are struggling with chronic insomnia, sleep hygiene it doesn't work, not in and of itself. Uh, as we all know who are in the field, that right. when you look at a, a study, you know, on insomnia, sleep hygiene is kind of like a control group. So it's not expected to really help much at all. 
So, but it does um, provide um, a way to keep insomnia at bay, if you will. Um, so, um, I, in the in nineties, when I started working with patients, I quickly realized that, and I was also researching on the side and working with the, the medical director as well. And we kind of realized, you know, we got to go beyond this the hygiene really help these people. And a primary focus was to get them off of sleeping medications. Um, Ambien was becoming very popular at the time and it was quickly being discovered that there were some problems. So that's actually a really good uh, comparison between sleep hygiene and CBTI. I mean, I completely agree with you that sleep hygiene is good, perhaps as a preventative measure, but once you're already down that rabbit hole and you're experiencing chronic insomnia, it's probably not going to help that much. Um, and I mean, all the studies kind of confirm that, which is unfortunate because for a lot of people, it's the first advice they get with chronic insomnia, you know, so then when it doesn't work because it's, that's not its intention, we become really worried that we're kind of beyond help. Um, so, and we can also, a lot of people I talk to, I, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, is they think that CBTI is the same thing as sleep hygiene. So they immediately discount it if they're lucky enough to even come across it in the first place. Probably like you, one of the first things I often hear is, oh, I, have, I, I don't do this, I don't do that, I do do this, I do do that. And they're basically going down a list of sleep hygiene probably because it was on a handout they got from their doctor. Oh yeah, absolutely. Or maybe their neighbor <laughs> shared a website with them or something like that. And so, yeah, like you said, they are often frustrated in part because they got those instructions right off the bat. Mm -hmm. They thought, oh, if I just do these, my sleep will improve. And they kind of do them and their sleep doesn't really get affected. And they've, you know, taken out some of the things they like to do. They like to have, you know, a cup of coffee in the afternoon with their friends, or they like to, you know, maybe do a kind of a casual social thing, but they withdraw and, you know, all that just makes the insomnia worse. Yeah, that's good. You know, that's something that I'd never really considered before. I mean, um, I did recently record a video just to remind people that it's okay to drink coffee if you have insomnia, you know, but now you've just mentioned that. Um, sleep hygiene really is all about kind of, controlling your life in more of a way that CBTI does. I think CBTI controls your life at night, but sleep hygiene controls your life in the day. And this has just occurred to me, like just talking to you now. Yeah, that's true. And I do think it's important, like, you know, caffeine is kind of a strong, potent chemical. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't like to dismiss it. Um, it will make your sleep, I believe, a little less deep if you have a moderate to large amounts in your system while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that's something I do remind patients that, you know, some people do fall asleep with caffeine, but, you know, I don't think their deep sleep percentage might be what it would be if they didn't have so much caffeine. So I do kind of like to make sure it's, it's, it's reasonable. You know, right. Like, I think I've heard you say no, no pot of coffee after dinner or something like that. Absolutely. But clearly it's not something to be scared about, you know. Yeah, Especially absolutely. It's involved with social things because social things are important for people to be engaged. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I have clients fill out a sleep diary, I actually have a section in there for like caffeine consumption, you know, and I've never had one client where I've looked at their sleep diary and been, oh, it's obviously the caffeine that's the cause of their insomnia. Um, most people drink moderate amounts and they're done by like noon. Um, and then, but I'll still have people concerned. They'll say, oh, I drank one cup of coffee at nine o'clock in the morning. Do I have to give this up? You know, so I'm kind of like, I don't know what your opinion is on this, but I'm kind of feel like if you're just drinking like one or two cups a day. Yeah. And everyone's a little different. If someone knows that they get pretty jittery with a little bit of caffeine, mm -hmm. they're very sensitive to it. Yeah. Maybe the last one at lunch is not a bad idea, but for someone who, you know, is just something they like to do. I'd say, just say, make sure you're not having like a couple big cups after dinner, you know, wrap up your last one before dinner and then, you know, call that good. That always seemed to be unreasonable for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's let's get back on the the CBTI track. So, what is it about why why does why is CBTI so effective? Why do you think it works so well for people with chronic insomnia? Well, first of all, it's not a medication which fail. They all all the medications will ultimately fail, and they're not designed to be long term. So CBTI, on the other hand, is completely it's basically behavioral with a little kind of, I like to say a kind of a dose of psychology thrown in. Um, 
it is very prescriptive and it gets really right to the root causes of the insomnia. It, it looks at that whole issue of effort to sleep, which I think is at the core of probably 90% of chronic insomnia is people mm -hmm. making willful efforts to initiate or reinitiate sleep. And those willful efforts start to cause anxiety, which is feeding the flames of insomnia. And then it just gets worse and worse. So CBTI directly addresses that. It restricts time in bed and it breaks that association between the bed and wakefulness and replaces it with the bed being associated with sleep. So that's why I think it's so effective. It's really very focused, very specific to chronic insomnia. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. You know, um, the, the, the techniques themselves are pretty straightforward, but they're tough to implement, you know, and I think that's what a lot of people struggle with, but I think that's why it works because it is quite prescriptive in the short term. Um, you know, you, you, you're given a sleep window that normally involves allotting less time for sleep than you're used to. Um, and then you're told to implement techniques, which kind of seem counterintuitive, you know, like spend less time in bed, get out of bed when you can't sleep. Um, so I think it is really important that, any course of CBTI includes like a lot of education, you know, just so people can understand why these techniques are important and the rationale behind them. Um, when I talk to people that have tried some of these things in the past, they didn't really understand why they were doing it. Um, like they knew it was the thing that they were supposed to do, but they didn't fully understand or they hadn't fully bought in to the why. And I think that's essential if it's going to like, if you're going to keep going, you know, or want to keep going. Right. And that's why it's also, it's important to be able to, to really be able to communicate with people well. You know, I think that's why, I think it's why a lot of doctors don't do it is because they don't have all that great at bedside manner. They went to medical school saving lives. And so, you know, they're looking at charts of organic organ systems in the body and trying to make sure like they're going to live. Well, CBTI is not that. You have to develop a rapport with the client or patient because you're going to ask them to do something that's like you just said, it's counterintuitive. It's physically demanding. It's, it's a challenge. And so if they're not, if you're not kind of relating with them, they're, they might just kind of say, Oh yeah, I'll try that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then they don't. So you have to, you have to show them through your own experience, through, um, you know, experience of other clients you've worked with that you understand what you're talking about mm -hmm. and that you can really make them feel confident enough to really give it a go. Because like you said, it is counterintuitive. Less time yeah. in bed, ultimately more sleep, but not right away. It's going to take a little work. So that's a tough message sometimes. Yeah, it is. And I think that that buy-in is essential if you're going to be consistent, you know, like here, I'll ask you a question. Have you ever seen someone be successful when they just kind of implement the CBTI techniques just every now and then, you know, so they'll, they'll do the stimulus control, which is getting in and out of bed when you can't sleep. Like they'll do it for a couple of nights, but then be like, oh, it's too hard. I'll stay in bed this night or they'll not pay attention to the sleep window so much. And they're just not very consistent. Have you ever seen someone be successful? No, I can't think of anyone. Okay. Maybe one name is escaping me, but in 30 years, no, I can't recall anyone that clearly has done that. It just doesn't really go away. You know, you have to make some changes for it to subside. A person mm -hmm. might be kind of predisposed, so they might have, you know, flare ups more often than another person, perhaps. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't just resolve something, it just magically go away. You have to address the issues that perpetuate it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, my experience too. Um, uh, I, I find that clients can be successful if they're not as consistent, but boy, it takes a lot longer. Yeah, it really does. And then it leads, you probably do the same. I started asking questions, you know, like what's keeping you from being consistent? What are, you know, what are your obstacles? Because people have, you know, I like to say life throws curveballs, you know, someone's got stuff going on and, and I've had patients in the lab, you know, I've had patients that live at the top of a hill in a mansion and patients that sleep in their car and everything in between. And you, you got to know where they're coming from to know how to help them tailor the CBI, CBTI techniques. So I know that's what you do as well. And anyone who does this realizes that. You can't just say the same thing to every single person. You have to be aware 
that they're coming from different places and they have different situations, uh, you know, bed partner, no bed partner, work, no work, whatever it is, um, there's things going on that a good sleep coach like yourself uh, really can help guide a patient through so they can implement the, um, the CBTI techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it is, you made a really good point there that, you know, we're all different and life does get in the way. And you know what? Life should get in the way sometimes, you know. So um, sometimes someone might be really upset that um, they went out with friends one night and they, they couldn't make it home for the start of their sleep window. You know, and I say, well, that's good. You're out having fun with friends. You know, that's life. Right. Because maybe they're a person who had been previously not going out and doing social things with friends. So it's sort of like, what's, what's, what's worse? You know, one night of not doing your sleep window versus being out with your friends that you haven't done in six months. I would probably argue it's the being out with friends for you haven't done for six months. That's probably a more helpful thing that particular night. Now, in the long long term, like you want to make sure they're back doing their sleep window and getting their sleep attention together. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So the consistency is key, but it's also important to recognize that, you know, you want to be living your life too. Um, so if there's going to be like, like you said, if you haven't been out with your friends for six months, but now like you, you feel like you're recognizing that it's important to do this and not let your insomnia control your life. You know, if you go to bed late one night, but in return, you've had all that fun and been out with your friends and lived your life, then, then it's worth it. As long as you're not doing it every single night, you know, uh, you can't expect to see improvements if you're doing it every yeah. night. You're not coming home until three in the morning. You're not, and you're not throwing a baseball through your sleep window, sleeping until noon the next day, you know, things like that. I mean, it's all kind of, you know, within reason. But mm -hmm. I, if someone, if a, if a client or a patient told me something like that, I would probably ask, when was the last time you were out with friends? That could be a really good sign. Maybe you're starting to feel a little better, more confident in yourself that you can allow yourself to do these things. Maybe you feel like you're presenting yourself as a better friend or more understanding, you're listening better, you're, you're, you're more interested in other people. These are all things that are clearly worth pointing out to someone who's been struggling with insomnia for maybe 20 years or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So leading on from this, because I know the sleep window is something that some people struggle with. Um, but what, what, other, what other kind of CBTI techniques do you find that people tend to be, either be more resistant or it just takes a lot more effort to, to be consistent with? Well, the big one, of course, is leaving the bed when you're, when you're awake at night. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's, that's probably the biggest quote unquote effort um, aspect. Um, but also, you know, some people like to lie around a bit in the afternoon um, if they don't work or something like that and asking them to be on their feet for a while instead. You know, I always kind of say, you know, napping is okay if it's really short, minimal, you know, quick little power nap in the early afternoon. It's not going to do anything to your sleep at night. Um, and if it makes you feel a little better to get through the afternoon, then it might be worth it. But you don't want to lie around all afternoon, you know, and so sometimes that can be effort you know and to clients and patients that you know you can't you can't fall asleep on your feet very easily so if you're on your feet you're probably not going to be lying around you're not going to you know suddenly wake up on the couch realizing you've been there for an hour and a half with the tv on um so i think you know that's a bit of an effort as well um other efforts um besides just the you know get up at the same time every morning pretty consistently um i like to say within maybe an hour at the most variant. So when we talk about them, that kind of works for them, it's a obligatory time of maybe six o'clock for work or something. Then I say, well, what about the non-work days? Oh, if they say seven or, or if they, excuse me, if they say nine or 10, I might say, you know what, how about let's go for seven o'clock? So you, you give them an hour of, of lying in the morning um, on their non-work days. But you know, that does obviously take effort. Mm -hmm. um, so getting out of bed in the middle of the night, getting up the same time every morning, clearly the two big ones, I think. Um, you know, most people are fine if you tell them to try to get out and walk a little more, do a little exercise during the day, get, get outside in the light. You know, the sunlight is such a great, you know, circadian setter. Um, it, it just, um, I, um, you know, the getting out of bed and getting up the same time are, to me, they're clearly the two biggest uh, effort components at CBPI. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the, the idea of getting up at the same time every day. Um, that can be very hard for, for people. Um, even, even clients that have to be up at a certain time uh, to start work. Um, 
but they, for whatever reason, they've decided that a sleep window that works best for them ends like say two hours before they actually have to be up. Mm-hmm. That might, that might just work out better for them. But then there's that eternal struggle in the morning of just like getting out of bed at that set time, you know, and trying to resist that temptation to stay in. Yeah. And I've thought about this quite a lot recently. And what I found is a good motivator to get you out of bed is to like create a social obligation. So if you have like a friend uh, that's that's like a morning person, for example, arrange to meet for a coffee at the coffee shop at like 7 a.m., you know, so you know that you don't want to let your friends down. You know that you have to be there to meet up with them. Right. Um, yeah. Or if you go to the gym, have your meet your trainer or meet a friend at a certain time. And that can really be a motivator to get out of bed at that yeah, consistent it's, time. It's that accountability which you're talking about that, you know, because I have, and we've, I both had clients or patients that talk about, you know, if they're fairly depressed, they, they might say, well, I don't have any reason to get out of bed. And they say that in a way like, you know, like it's a psychological thing. It's not just, oh, I, I haven't scheduled something for tomorrow. It's I never have a reason to get out of bed because their life is really, really challenging. Um, so, you know, you, you, we don't do psychotherapy with CBTI, but we do clearly talk to people about things that could be barriers to the behavioral goal, like getting out of bed at the same time. And sometimes it is simple things like finding out if they have a neighbor who checks in on them or if they have, uh, you know, an exercise thing that they could go do, like you were talking about, um, like around here, we have a, a, a moderately sized shopping mall and they open up their doors, I think at 530 in the morning for people who want to walk on those hot summer days that we get down here. Um, you know, it's a great thing. I, and I let my patients know that. So, you know, it's just sort of knowing things like that, that can really give them a way to implement a behavior that you, that's the ultimate goal of what you want them to do. The goal isn't to get up and walk around the mall. The goal is to get up at the same time. I don't care what you, you do. I just want you out of bed at the same time. But this kind of gives them a little extra, you know, something to look forward to. And uh, things, just simple things like that sometimes go a real long ways. Yeah. And something as simple as well is just like understanding like sleep drive, this sleep pressure, you know, and if we just get up, instead of staying in bed for those extra hour or extra two hours, if we just get up right now, that's more time for us to build this sleep drive, to build this sleep pressure during the day. And so staying in bed might feel good at the time, but it's that trade-off, right? You might then struggle to fall asleep that night. Um, so just like you said, like these psychoeducation, like the educational side of it is so important too. I completely agree. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, so when you're seeing patients in your environment, is there like a typical amount of time it takes for someone to see benefits in their sleep when they incorporate CBTI or is it just the case that everyone is different? You know, there are some people that you can pick up on kind of pick up some vibes early on where you just know they're going to really do well with CBTI. They seem to have great position and they understand what you're talking to them about. They're they're learning the concepts. They see the logic. they, they, They understand them. And they have the type of insomnia that is just anxiety driven. And those people in my mind tend to be the ones that can sometimes turn everything around in literally like a week or two. Um, you know, they just, they just really dive into it. They start to make really great progress after two weeks. They're, they're just clearly going in the right direction. They understand everything you've told them and they have great tools at their disposal and they know it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you, you know, some people aren't like that. They might present kind of a strange uh, type of sleeping pattern or um, you might think there's other things going on during sleep. They might have a little bit of sleep apnea that could be undetected at the time. And, um, or they might be on some certain medications that really kind of disrupt sleep. Um, and so those are clearly the, I think, the ones that take longer because maybe their, their gains might not be quite as robust. Um, they can still definitely make gains and I let them know that, but, um, that would be someone I would probably have to kind of look at in a bigger picture. Like what kind of, uh, you know, what are our goals here? What are, what are our, what are our expectations? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, you know, maybe it's someone who's, you know, in their mid to late eighties or in their nineties, perhaps and they have a lot of mobility issues. 
medication things going on, it's kind of like we want to make sure we're we're not trying to you know do Herculean things here. Um, you know, there are issues of you know suggesting people get out of bed at night. I you know you, I'm sure you do the same thing. You always want to make sure mobility is good, and if it's questionable, you know then maybe it's sit up in bed instead of getting out of bed. Um, things like that. That would be a type of a, a person that I might not expect to respond real robustly or quickly. So it can take anywhere from like maybe a, like two weeks all the way to, I mean, I've worked with people off and on. Well, you probably have done longer than I have, you know, but maybe, maybe three or four months, you know, something like that. And um, I try to get them at least going in the right direction, um, especially in the hospital setting where I um, do the education. Uh, you know, the hospital isn't just saying, yeah, have them come back as many times as they want. It's, it's more restricted. Uh, and um, so anyways, it's, it's, that's kind of my experience. It can be maybe a week or two uh, at the shortest, do some things, you know, a few months. They really are working on it. Yeah. I, I have to, I had to ask you that question just because it's a question I get a lot um, from clients and non-clients. Like um, they always want to compare their progress to the progress of other people just as, and I try and deflect from that because we're all different, but it's, it's such a common question. I wanted to ask you just to get your viewpoint. Um, so I just tell them, well, everyone's different. If you're consistent, you'll generally see some kind of improvement within a few weeks. But in terms of whatever your definition of success is, that could take many months of consistent implementation. Yes. Um, and it's so important not to give yourself like this, this time plan, like I need to be better within four weeks or within two months or within three months because you're just putting unnecessary pressure on yourself. Right. Exactly. And, you know, qualifying things with, you know, well, it, it kind of depends on the person. You know, if the person says, how long will this take? I say, well, how much effort are you willing to put into this? Mm -hmm. Let me describe what I'm asking you to do. And then you'll know how long maybe it will take based on what you really want to do. And um, so that's part of the equation as well for how long it might take. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's important to, to have realistic goals, you know, like it, when I have a new client enroll, if they tell me, well, my goal is to get eight hours of sleep every single night. Um, well, the first thing I have to do is kind of explain that that would be really unusual for first of all, to get eight hours of sleep and then to get that every single night of the week, that would be pretty incredible. Um, cause not many people can do that. <laughs> no, no, it's, you know, teenagers aside you know when someone starts talking eight hours of sleep you know we both know it's not it's not what's normal and uh you know when you get longer than eight hours then you know there's some studies that show it's not necessarily sleeping longer so um you know that whole duration of sleep i try to really don't i don't really get into it because it doesn't really matter the long do you sleep it doesn't ultimately matter all that matters is is your sleep decent quality and is it not elusive if your sleep is elusive that's a problem if it's not good quality like you don't feel good when you get up in the morning or you don't hold your energy level during the day that's not good either those are the two big things it's not i don't care how many hours you say you slept because you know of course the reality is they probably don't know actually how much they sleep you know the trackers no one really knows truly night to night how much they're actually sleeping. So it's not something worth focusing on to me. When you can ask yourself, how do you feel? That's really the ultimate question. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. I think sleep quality is really all we should ever judge our sleep on. Um, yeah, if we feel good during the day, um, we're not feeling excessively sleepy during the day. We feel like we're productive. Um, and the chances are it's like 99% of the time you're going to be sleeping just fine for your individual sleep needs. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's not elusive, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't feel like it takes forever to fall asleep. You don't feel like you're awake forever in the middle of the night. You know, these things are, are these are goals to work towards. I like to use the word elusive, make sleep less elusive. So, you know, just make sure that falling asleep feels like it happens reasonably easy um, and getting back to sleep in the middle of the night also feels reasonably easy. These are goals to work towards because they reduce anxiety. Um, it's like anything. If you have more confidence in what you're doing, you're less anxious about it. You know, if I was here talking about, you know, 
astrophysiology or something, I would probably be, you know, very nervous because I don't know what I'd be talking about, but I'm talking about sleep and I have some experience. So I feel confident in it. Well, mm -hmm. someone who loses confidence in their sleep, that drives worry and anxiety, which, which perpetuates the insomnia. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good tip on on the sleep duration front. The only time really we should pay any attention to duration is, like you say, if it takes us an excessive amount of time to fall asleep, or if we're we're just awake for an excessive amount of time during the during the night. Um, that's the only time really, but that's obvious, you know, because if you're struggling to fall asleep at night or you're struggling to stay asleep, you're going to feel lousy during the day. So it still just comes back to how you feel during the day as being the ultimate guide, right? It's a very, um, it's a very introspective thing. I encourage my clients and patients to be introspective. You're the one who answers the question. How do I feel? How easy is sleep? How difficult is sleep? It, trying to track it, trying to gauge it in other ways, focusing on a duration of sleep, all of that just makes things worse. <laughs> and so getting someone to be introspective can be sometimes challenging. Yeah. So, in your work with patients with insomnia, do you have any success stories that you can think of? Like, was there someone that just seemed to really struggle with implementing the techniques? They maybe relapsed a few times, um, but they stay committed and they managed to get their sleep back on track. Yes. Um, the relapse thing is, um, it, it can be a challenge. Um, I know I have had patients who have relapsed um, maybe make some initial gains and then they kind of stop doing the techniques that I got over with them. And then you quickly kind of realize that they're not progressing because they're not doing the techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, there is one, one, I remember a, a patient I had, this was years ago, probably 15, maybe 20 years ago, um, that I'll never forget because, you know, one of the, um, he was a big strapping guy, all right? Big, big, tough guy. I think probably mm. we're on the four horse line, probably two hundred jack or something. Like that. Big, tough guy. So he, he came in and he was really struggling with sleep, really having trouble getting to sleep. And, um, you know, he, 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 he came in and, you know, I'm going through the techniques with him. And one of the techniques that we typically um, at least introduce is the idea of kind of that worry time, that um, – writing things down during the day to kind of process things that might be on your mind at night. Kind of a big proponent of that because, you know, your, your, your um, brain physiology changes, you know, when you get drowsy, that prefrontal cortex logic stuff kind of goes out the window and you're more kind of brainstem, amygdala, emotional person. So I was getting to that point when I was educating him and I kind of, dismissed it. I thought, oh, this guy, he doesn't have any worries. I mean, look at him. He's like as tough as nails and all that. And he wasn't making any, really much progress. I, I started some sleep restriction and all that, but you could tell he kind of just had a lot of trouble in bed. You know, he, he kept talking about an active mind that started to come you know, when I saw him the second time. And I, so I started asking him more about it and he had some, you know, some real issues that he was pretty worried about that weren't necessarily sleep related. Some of it was sleep related. And a lot of the people that you work with and I work with, you know, the worry of sleep has reached the top of the list, right? It's at the top. I'm worried about my sleep. This guy, he wasn't at the top. He had some other things um, that I, I, I realized maybe could benefit from writing them down during the day, taking five or 10 minutes at lunch, processing some things, you know, writing a few ideas and possible solutions and kind of taking more of an active approach during the day when you're thinking a little more clearly. And that turned out to really help him. He commented that was probably the, the big thing that really helped him with everything else with CBTI. And so what he taught me was that you can't assume things about your clients or your patients. Because as soon as you assume something, you're going to get surprised. You know, if you start to get in the routine of, oh, I know this kind of patient. Oh, I know the kind of client. I know who they are. I've, I've dealt with this. You're going to get surprised. Because sleep is kind of a it's like a whole life thing. Anything can really affect it. So you kind of have to pay attention even with people, clients or patients that you feel like you've, you've talked to before, but you feel like you've met this kind of person. Maybe, maybe not. So I'll never forget that guy. And I always, with every CBT component, I always make sure I give it due diligence, no matter what I think of the person sitting across the table or on the other side of the screen um, for me. Yeah, I think that's that's. I think this is another reason why CBTI is so effective because it 
is a combination of techniques. It's not just one technique, you know, so someone might respond really well to just sleep restriction, which is a terrible name, like just having a shorter sleep window that more closely matches how much time they sleep. And they may not even need to implement stimulus control because just shrinking down the sleep window immediately gives them more consolidated sleep. But someone else, the sleep window may not be effective by itself, but once they combine it with the stimulus control, then it helps. Other people, they might still be struggling because their minds are just racing all night long. And so kind of reallocating that thinking time to a period during the day can be really helpful, like you've said. And I think this is just part of the beauty of CBTI because it just, it has something for everyone in there. Yeah. And you really have to, yeah, exactly. You have to look at everything. I, I like to joke, I have, you know, an endless wall of hats that I wear, you know, when I'm talking to someone about their sleep, you know, you, sometimes you're kind of their friend, their coach, their, the sympathetic person, the empathetic person. You kind of have to play all the roles depending on the per person and depending on their situation. Uh, let, let me ask you this. When you're working with a patient and you're going through a course of CBTI, um, do you tend to find that their progress is completely linear, i.e. every single week they do a check-in or every two weeks they check in, it's like improvement, 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 improvement. Or do you see some improvement, then some relapse, then some improvement, then some relapse? The short answer is yes. <laughs> All of the above. Um, I, I, I usually see some progress after maybe an initial visit and then they come back a couple weeks later. But I let every person I work with know that initially, it's it's not uncommon to go backwards. You know that first week can be challenging, and your worry might even go up because, you know, you know you're you're doing what you were asked, but you don't necessarily feel better right away, and you're really wondering is this working, and that can cause anxiety. So I just I just kind of give them a heads up. You know, and I, and the analogy I like to use, it's kind of like, um, if someone was not physically fit and they started to go to the gymnasium to get fit first couple times, not fun. You know, you, you're tired, you're achy, you're sore. Someone's, you know, barking at you to lift this or move that way or whatever. It's just not necessarily all that enjoyable, but then you hang in there and like all kinds of training, even physical training. And you start to feel a little better. And then the, the, the kind of the holy grail is you then start to look forward to it. So sleep is kind of like that. CBTI is kind of like that. I find the first week or two, if someone really dives into it, it can be a little bit of a dip. And then they kind of are turning the corner by the time I see them maybe a couple of weeks out. The first week, I kind of don't even really like to check in with them too much. I might after a couple of days just to make sure they understand. They have a plan. They're, you know they know they're getting started or they're going to get started like tonight or something like that. But then I know there's a few days or nights where a lot of people just kind of want to sort things out. You got all the, you know, you got the whole, pres the whole prescription right there. Here's the behavioral things to do and just work it out. You know, you might need to work out some things that you don't need to necessarily talk to anyone about it. So after a couple of weeks, they've usually turned the corner. And then, like I said, they start to feel a little better. And then the Holy grail, which Unfortunately, you know, a lot of us who work with people with chronic insomnia, we don't necessarily get to see these people at this point where they're doing so well on sleep, they don't really need to talk to you and they, they, and they enjoy sleep. They look forward to going to bed. You know, they, they, it's just like they know how restorative it is and they know that they don't have to lie there for, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours and they're, everything else in their life is pretty much improving health, psychology, whatever it is, that that's kind of like the ultimate, that's the holy grail, right? But unfortunately, we don't often get to talk to them at that point. They're kind of on doing their thing and good for them and they should be. But um, it, that's how I, I, the analogy I use is kind of like, you know, if you're, if you're out of shape and you become fit. Yeah, I like the analogy. Here's another reason why I like this analogy is because, all right, so say you're going to the gym to get fitter. Um, it's hard at first, but then as you start to recognize the gains you're making, you feel good, but then maybe you have an injury and then you have a bad time at the gym, you know, just as like you might have a bad night of sleep. You don't really want to just dwell on the fact that, all right, that one time you went to the gym, you got an injury. So now for we have to call it all off. It's really important to recognize that 
bad nights are still going to happen and not to judge your progress every single morning, you know, just based on how you did last night. Uh, you want to kind of, I mean, I always say at least look at your sleep over at least a week, ideally at least two weeks to get a better idea of how you're doing, you know, because sleep is so responsive to our daily lives as well. You know, if we have an argument with our partner before we go to bed, we're probably going to struggle to sleep. If we're, we're on a tight deadline at work, we're probably going to struggle to sleep. Um, and if we ha if we've got this really deeply entrenched insomnia that we've had for years, if not decades, it's going to take time to shift that, you know, and so it needs this consistency with the CBTI techniques and the more consistent we are with them, the more consistent our sleep will become. Um, but there's still going to be ups and downs along the way. Right. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, I kind of like to keep things, you know, light with my clients and patients. And I might say, you know, you're going to sleep every night of your life. So let's not get hung up on just a couple nights here. Like, you know, tomorrow night's another chance to try something different during the day or in the evening or something like that, that might make a big difference. It's like you have, you can kind of experiment with some of the, th the ways that you're implementing some of the strategies to find the routine that works well for you. So like you said, it's just like if you went to the gym and had one bad experience, it doesn't just derail everything. You know, you, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you look at what happened for a moment and you say, okay, maybe I just need to adjust this. And you look forward. You don't look back. Right. So it, it's, it's a, it's a huge message for people struggling with insomnia because they do get very focused and obsessed on every single night. And it, and often sleeping medications play into that as well. And you know, the torturous, should I take this pill at this time or not? Should I cut it in half? Should I take two of those or what, you know, all these kinds of things. I, I see a lot of people like that. And, um, so you have to take, you have to encourage them somehow to take a big picture approach. Like you said, at least a week kind of chunk of time. Um, you know, when they do a sleep log, maybe it's a, you know, a month long sleep log or something like that. I don't even really care about the first week or two as much as maybe the last week, last 10 days. Like, what have you been doing lately? What have you, you know, you've dusted off, you've, you've, you've cleared some things out in the beginning. Like, what are you doing now? Like, where, have, how far have you progressed? That's where I kind of like to focus. And of course, show them if they've made progress the whole time. But really kind of honing in on what are the, what are the successes? What are you doing that's working lately? Instead of them trying to remember what happened three weeks ago on a particular night. I'm like, don't even worry about that. Let's look forward and see where we go from here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's really important to just bear in mind that there's always going to be ups and downs on the journey. You know, I typically will work with someone um, over the course of, say, eight weeks. And if, if I was to do a fancy line chart over the course of the eight weeks, it would be ups and downs, ups and downs. But generally, the trend is generally positive over, over that period. But they might start off and immediately respond and do really well and then have like two or three weeks where it really struggle and then a good week and then maybe a bad week, you know? And so it's really important to recognize and not beat yourself up or be hard on yourself when you have these bad nights because you're already doing the best thing possible, which is committing and implementing these techniques, you know? And it's a long-term play, you know, it, it's, it's difficult, but if you're consistent, I always say this, if you're consistent with the techniques, your sleep will become more consistent in return. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, we start off as educators and then we move into the coaching role. Mm -hmm. And so I always make sure that a client knows that I'm first trying to help them understand the components of CBTI because perhaps they've had some misinformation or maybe just don't have certain, all certain things. but then once they get it, once I can tell that they get it, it's, you become a coach, right? You clearly become a coach who is guiding them. They know the principles, they understand them, but then, you know, reminding them that they're human. You know, that's a good thing to remind people of now and then. What does that mean? That means that maybe you don't do the right thing all the time. You know, I'm not supposed to eat a lot of chocolate chip cookies. You put a plate in front of me, one of them might be missing. I just have to confess. And I kind of tell them that, like, you know, don't, like you said, don't beat yourself up over this. You try to do the best you can and that's all you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on, you have an app called sleep on Q. Uh, it helps people improve their sleep using a technique known as intensive sleep retraining. So can you tell us a bit more about what intensive sleep retraining is 
um, maybe how it works in relation to your app and how it can help people with insomnia improve their sleep. Yeah. It's funny. You thought uh, sleep restriction was a horrible term. Intense <laughs> sleep retraining. See if everyone doesn't go running for the hills. Um, okay, so it was a procedure that was actually first looked at maybe in the late seventies, early eighties for the very first time, but they didn't really, it wasn't really similar to what it is now. And it was called a different name really was in, in the early 2000s that they started to look at it. And by they, I mean this research group, um, down in, uh, in South Australia, down at Flinders University, they were the ones that really kind of done the, the seminal work on all of this. And the idea is that, um, is that with, with CBTI, we're, one of the core elements is stimulus control. We're trying to get the person to associate the bed with sleep and nothing else, just, you know, intimacy mm -hmm. in the bed is basically bed is sleep. So with CBTI, we instruct them, as we've been talking about, over, you know, night after night, don't go to bed unless you're truly sleepy. Get out of bed if you're not sleepy. Get up at the same time every morning. So it's the, that's what we do to try to drive their sleep in a stronger at night to make their sleep more consolidated and all that. And so the, the thinking by the, this research group was, well, you know, what if we can do something maybe that's even more intense, more possibly even more efficient than that? Um, because the idea is that with stimulus control instructions, the, the person is probably only getting one rapid sleep onset per night. Like if they lay there and they're in trouble sleeping, they get out of bed and they go read for a little bit, they come back to bed and maybe they lay there for a while, then they get out of bed. Eventually they fall asleep quickly. That's, that, that's the one time that night they're going to have a rapid initiation of sleep. And so that's the goal. The goal is to get them to fall asleep quickly um, or back to sleep quickly. And so they said, well, what if we kind of structured this and said, what if we give someone a little bit of time for maybe like 24 hours, a t an opportunity to fall asleep, just a short opportunity, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And then if they do fall asleep, we'll wake them up, get them out of bed. A few minutes later, put them back to bed and have them do it again for 24 hours, bedtime to bedtime. So that's kind of what sleep intensive sleep retraining is. It's repeated short opportunities to fall asleep. And and additionally, it's with awareness feedback, and that's a real important component of it. So the way it works is that, you know, you're starting around bedtime, the person, uh, the way the studies were done, it was in a sleep laboratory with wires on their head and the whole record your sleep thing. And they gave them 20 minutes to fall asleep. If the person didn't fall asleep in 20 minutes, they knew that because of the brainwave recordings. They went in, told the person, well, you didn't fall asleep, get out of bed. Or they asked them, do you think you did fall asleep? And the person says, well, no, I've just been laying here. Okay, you're right. Get out of bed. And then they came back on the half hour and did it again. The other scenario was the person did fall asleep. Say they put him down for a an, first nap at bedtime. The person does fall asleep within the 20 minutes. They, go, they, they make sure they get a couple minutes of sleep recording going so they're, they're really sure. They go in, they wake the person up, they say, do you think he just fell asleep? And the person either said, yeah, I think so, or no, I don't think so. And then they're given the correct answer right then and there because they know they have the brainwave recordings going. That creates awareness, awareness of what does falling asleep even feel like. Then they say, okay, now that you know if you're right or wrong, get out of bed for a few minutes, come back on a half, half hour, do it again. So those are the two scenarios. Either they fell asleep in a, in a sleep trial, as they call it. Either they fell asleep within those 20 minutes or they didn't fall asleep. Either way, they're asked, do you think you fell asleep? Given the correct answer, kicked out of bed for a few minutes, back to bed on the half hour. So that. that is the intense sleeping um, technique. Um, at time to bedtime, so then after 24 hours, they say, okay, you're done, put them in a taxi, take them home, and they sleep. They, they found that it was comparable to sleep, uh, a sleep uh, uh, stimulus control uh, control group. Um, and in fact, they found that when you added stimulus control to, to intensive sleep retraining, the effects were even enhanced. Because you can do a 24 hour intensive sleep retraining procedure. And then from that point forward for a few weeks, have them do regular CBTI. It doesn't preclude them doing CBTI. It's a way you, you can almost, almost start off doing CBTI with it. So they combine the two. And that's what was interesting that they found an additive effect. And these people, it wasn't just immediate improvement. It wasn't short, just short term. It was, I think they looked them six months down the road and they had maintained their, uh, their improvement in their sleep mm -hmm. and their insomnia. But that is intensive sleep retraining 
Um, I, um, when I first read this, the big 2012 um, uh, uh, controlled study, uh, they were basically calling for an at-home version. The you know, doctor, two famous ins insomnia sleep researchers, uh, uh, Dr. Glovinsky and Spielman, who, by the way, kind of coined the 3P model thing of insomnia, they they concluded with a review of the study and they said, this is really good. We need to be able to do this at home. Someone needs to come up with a way to do it at home. And I remember staring at that paragraph for about five minutes going, yeah, someone does need to figure out how to do this. At home. And this was in 2012. Um, and so, you know, there were smartphones around, but they weren't necessarily as common as they are now. They're getting pretty common. And so I tried different devices at first. I was you know, to try to come up with a home version of letting someone give them an opportunity over and over to fall asleep and letting them know if they did fall asleep. Like that was what ISR is. So I start off with gadgets. Like one thing was like this ball that you'd hold in your hand and I had an accelerometer inside of it and like a nine volt battery and a wrist tether. And I had some guy down at the local community college working on it for his project. And I'd be down there every other day. We'd be, I'd just be scratching my head going, there's gotta be a way to do this. Well, long story short, I decided to do a smartphone app. The smartphones have accelerometers. And what I decided was to use a call and response uh, method. Um, so what the app does is it guides you through these repeated short sleep opportunities and it sends you an audible tone to which you have to respond. And the way you respond is by laying in bed, doing this short sleep opportunity. And when you hear a tone, you give the phone a slight jiggle, very mm -hmm. slight. The accelerometer is like cranked up to levels that I forget even how to describe. But trust me, it's very sensitive to movement. As long as you're giving the phone a little jiggle after each tone, the app knows you're still awake. If you stop giving the phone a little jiggle, the app says, ah, this person's fallen asleep. Then what it does following the ISR protocol is it vibrates to wake the person up. The person looks at their phone and says, do you think you fell asleep? Yes or no? You tap a button, yes or no? And then it tells you the correct answer. Either, yeah, you're right, you did fall asleep, or no, you're incorrect, you didn't fall asleep, or whatever combination it was. Then it says, now get out of bed for a few minutes, and there's a little countdown timer, and then three minutes, I suggest, and then they come back to bed. So just enough time to maybe use the restroom, grab a sip of water or stretch or something, and you're back to bed and you do it again. So that allows you to do more sleep opportunity, sleep uh, nap hour. You can stack more uh, sleep trials uh, per unit of time by, by my app. And the, other, and the last thing that, that my app does that helps with doing more sleep trials in a short period of time is that it varies the amount of time gives time. So in the research, they did 20 minutes. 20 minute opportunity, that was fixed. Every, every sleep trial on the half hour, that was fixed. My app, if you fall asleep during a sleep trial, the next sleep trial is slightly shorter. And it keeps getting shorter as long as you keep falling asleep. If you don't fall asleep in a sleep trial, next sleep trial is slightly longer. It adds just a little bit of time. So it's constantly varying as you're doing your, you know, that's, it's a way to get a lot of sleep trials in, which is why I suggest when people get the app, maybe they only do it for, you know, 15 or 20 sleep trials starting around bedtime, which might take them into like, you know, 12, 12, 31 in the morning or something like that until they're just kind of sick of it. And when you're sick of doing sleep trials, just put your phone down and sleep. It's not meant to put you to sleep, right? Because nothing will, as we all know. But it's not a gadget. It's not a gimmick to say, oh, yeah, listen to these ocean sounds and you'll drift off to sleep or these binaural things or whatever it is. It's just sleep training. It's really stimulus control kind of amplified. And so I personally think it's a great thing to do while a person is waiting for their delayed bedtime, maybe through their sleep window. Um, you know, if they're instructed maybe to go to bed at 1230 or one, instead of like sitting around watching TV where you might tend to doze on the couch or something like that and not realize it, um, or you don't might be just like kind of fidgety wondering what you're gonna do with your time, maybe go to bed and do some sleep training for 90 minutes or something like that. Maybe do 10 or 12 sleep trials. It gives a person a way to kind of practice falling asleep is really probably the best way to describe it. And at the end, they get a graph. It's a bar graph, and it shows how how well they did falling asleep and how well they did with their awareness of whether they fell asleep. Um, it's kind of just a simple little bar graph. So it's um, yeah, it's called Sleep on Cue. Kind of a play on words, right? I mean, kind of sleeps on cue. Um, but it's um, it's a, it's the only way to do 
um, intensive sleep re- retraining with a standalone app. You don't have to buy. There's no wearable. There's no extra gadget. The mm-hmm. app just is what it is. There's no things you got to buy. No in-app purchases and things like that. Like buy a game, buy stuff. Nothing like that. There's no advertisements. It's just you know me on the phone with some researcher or with some you know programmers for the better part of a year in the middle of the night trying to explain what I'm talking about. Um, so. Um, yeah, it's just a really, it, it takes some effort. Um, you know, people will say it, it's effective. You have to be pretty focused to do it. Um, you know, it's kind of like, I almost like to think of this. And here's, I'll, I'll, I'll use this. I'll finish with the, talk about the app with this analogy. I feel like I, I invented the hill. By that, I mean, if you're not fit and there's a hill, you can run up and down it as many times as you want. You'll probably eventually get fit. So, I invented the hill for sleep. You have to run up the hill. You have to do the training. It's not, you know, you can't just look at the screen. That doesn't do anything. In fact, you rarely look at the screen when you're using the app. Most of the time you're just holding it in the bedroom and you're waiting for the tone, which you might use earbud headphones or something like that. You're just waiting for the tone to respond to. You're not, you're not engaged with the app. There's no programming things. You're not doing stuff on it. You're really just minimally engaged with it, with the screen. So, it takes some willpower and effort, but the studies are pretty clear with intensive sleep retraining, retraining that there's a pretty good additive effect um, that could possibly enhance um, DBTI in general, specifically um, simulating fall complaints. That's, that's really interesting. So, so let's say that I decided that I want. I've been struggling with insomnia for a long time. I want to give this a try. So I go to the app store, I download it. Is this something that? I would be doing every night for like a number of weeks or a number of months, or is it something that I can just expect to do for a couple of nights and then I'm done with it? So the way I answer that question is to look at the original research in intensive sleep retraining, ISR. What they did before the person came to the laboratory to do the 24 hour procedure, the night before at home, they were sleep deprived. They, mm-hmm. I think they gave them five hours of time in bed. And that was it. So they showed up to the lab the next night around bedtime, already kind of tired, extra tired. So what I, one thing I don't do is tell anyone who gets my app, you know, sleep deprive yourself and then use my app because no one puts their car in a ditch. I get a call from a lawyer and my life ends. So what I say is if you happen to have a rough night, which, you know, someone with insomnia is saying, Okay, got that checked off nightly. Okay. But you know, if you have a if you have a particularly rough night, the next night might be a really good time to do a little bit of sleep training around bedtime. Your natural sleep drive might be a little bit stronger. And, and that's what they were trying to do in the research, drive up their homeostatic sleep drive to start off these sleep trials. And then if you think about it, over the 24 hours that they did them in the laboratory, not much sleep was accumulated. They only let them sleep a couple minutes when they did fall asleep in a sleep trial. Do you follow that? So by bedtime the next night, they hadn't really gotten much sleep over the last 48 hours. They were pretty sleepy. So with my app, I say, you know what? If you have a rough night, you might try doing like 15 or 20 sleep trials or something like that. I think it gives a person a good experience of what the app does. They start to kind of, it, it, it's, it's sort of hard to describe. It's kind of nonspecific. I've talked to other people that have told me that. Um, and uh, um, I was interviewed on a different podcast um, a while back, and, and the, the interviewer had actually used the app, and he was describing that to me. He said two things. One is it takes some willpower and effort to do it. You have to, it's the hill. You got to tell yourself to run up it. And second is um, that you, um, it, 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 how it helps you is hard to describe. Because I said, oh, did you find that it helped you more with falling asleep rather than getting back to sleep in the middle of the night? And he said, no, actually, it was kind of equal, which kind of surprised me because the research mostly focused on trouble falling asleep, that type of sleep onset insomnia. They didn't really look at the getting back to sleep in the middle of the night thing. And I think they're going to be looking at that. But the, the interviewer, the podcast interview, he described that. He said, no, that was kind of equally as helpful. And it was really helpful. It was uplifting for me to, and I got some good, you know, feedback, direct feedback that I even helped with that. So, um, I think that, you know, it's hard to, de- it's hard to verbalize how it helps with insomnia. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really, you know, I look at it as, you know, if you really want to do something direct with your insomnia, like you just want to 
right to the chase. You want to start working on it right away. It might be the thing to try. It's definitely like a, um, an awareness thing, an awareness mm -hmm. about getting sleepy um, that is maybe lost in someone who struggles with chronic insomnia. Like you said, they say, mm -hmm. oh, I never get sleepy. We've all heard that from people. I never get sleepy. I don't even know what sleep feels like. I've I, sometimes I don't sleep at all. You know, all these kind of lack of awareness kinds of comments, it really helps with that because you repeatedly over and over and over again get to know if what you just experienced was sleep or not. And the app does a pretty good job with that. I should say it's, it, it was validated in a pilot study that the same Flinders group, they're great down there actually in Flinders, by the way. I, I want to comment that shout out to all of them, Dr. Lack, Hannah Scott, all of them, really great researchers. They were really helpful with me and they did some actual independent research with my app. Um, and one thing that they did that they studied was how good is the app? app at detecting sleep onset. I mean, that's a core question. This thing vibrates and then says, do you think you just fell asleep? Well, how do I know it? I, that I actually did fall asleep. Maybe the app is wrong. And that's absolutely a possibility. The correlation was like in the 80s for yeah. compared with PSG, with brainwave polysomnography recordings. And I was really, really encouraged when I saw that number because what it correlated with was not stage one onset. That was lower. But then you ask humans to identify stage one and you get a lot of variability. Hmm. You get stage two, the next more stable type of sleep. Starting up, humans, as well as my app, both are much better at detecting that type of sleep. So what, be, and this all went back, just I'm trying to bore you here, but I went back to research like from the 60s where they were looking at audible tones and your awareness of the tone. And how did you respond to the tone? And what really came out of all that was when your brain starts to generate something called a sleep spindle, a little squiggly waveform that we see in stage two sleep, as soon as it starts to do that, you're pretty well cut off from your environment. You pretty much won't respond to anything. Not very well. Compared to stage one, that first light transitional state two, someone might be in it for three or four minutes, and then you go and tap them on the shoulder and you say, do you think you were just sleeping? Oh, I wasn't sleeping. No, I, you just came in the room. What, what do you want? I'm awake. When you look at the brain waves, the brain waves are saying, that's all stage one. You get to that sleep spindle stage, stage two, and the person is much more likely to say, yeah, I think maybe I was asleep. So they're much more likely to not respond to an audible tone. So I program the app in a way, giving it enough duration, and I, and I even drew on my own experience with polysomnography, this field I've been in forever, of what is the, what is the brain doing? Like I was using my app, testing it out, and I'm trying to picture my brain. And then I even went into the sleep lab and had someone put wires on me and I used the app. I did this two or three times because I wanted to, like, I know what I feel like. Like, I'm, okay, so that would have shown this and that would have shown, and I was like almost testing it on myself. And lo and behold, when they did that pilot study, they found that it was a pretty strong correlation with the onset of stage two because you want the person to know whether they fell asleep or not. You want them to be able to perceive that. That's what the app get, lets the person get to that level before it wakes them up and asks them. So yeah, that's uh, that's the Sleep On Q app. All right, great. Well, so it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's anything you want to add, but it sounds to me as though this app could be really helpful for people that either feel that they don't have these cues for sleepy sleepiness anymore. You know, when they, if you say this statement, I don't get sleepy, then your app sounds like it's worth trying. And again, for more like this paradoxical insomnia, maybe, whereby you're convinced that you haven't been sleeping, but you've been told that you are actually getting some sleep. The app could be helpful there at helping you discern between sleep and wakefulness. Yeah. And I think the key term is awareness. It helps you improve your awareness, which in turn helps you actually fall asleep with less worry. Um, and and the app doesn't connect to the internet or anything like that. You can shut everything down on your phone and it turns into basically a gadget. I just needed it to do a few functions and have an accelerometer. That was really what I was looking for. If it was something other than a phone, I would have used something other than a phone. But right. because everyone has phones and, you know, it's, it's not that difficult to program things. Although this was a little challenging with some of the, some of the accelerometer features more than I realized. Um, it, it, it's just, it's a gadget. You're lying there and you're using, or I should say a tool. I don't like the word gadget. It's a tool helping you learn what it feels like to get sleepy or to be asleep. And you train, just like you don't take the, 
you know, the, the barbell home from the gym after you're done to keep lifting weights throughout your rest of your day, you do it to train. And that's what the app does. It's for mm-hmm. training short term, a little while. And I think, I think in some people, it's a great way to kickstart CBTI. Great. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for telling us more about intensive sleep retraining as well. Um, and clarifying some points on that. Um, I'm going to, I think we should wrap it up now because I've taken a lot of your time. Um, but let me ask you this, like if there's someone listening to this or watching this chronic insomnia, they feel like they've tried everything. They're beyond help. There's nothing they can do to improve their sleep. What would you tell that person? I would tell them that they likely have not heard everything what they what they have heard was possibly not described correctly um and if they're adamant that they have that they've tried everything i will even back up a step i always make sure they've asked their doctor is there anything that could just be sabotaging all of your efforts like do you have this huge restless legs problem where your brain is just reacting over and over and over again hundreds of times every single night well cbti isn't going to help that much do you have treated sleep apnea, snore like a freight train, you, you know, you get the elbow to roll over, you know, 10, 15 times every single night, all of these really strong signs of another sleep disorder, yeah, talk to your doctor about that. Same medic, talk to your doctor. They could be sabotaging your efforts. But if all that's kind of under control, I like to tell people you haven't heard at all. You got to find someone like Martin Reed at insomniacoach.com <laughs> and say, hey, I think I've heard it all. But can we go over it? Can you, you know, let me know? Is this what I should be doing? And chances are very possible that they have not heard it explained correctly, not been guided correctly um, with, uh, with CBTI. Um, my app, sometimes I might suggest they might read about it, you know, see if it makes sense, see if they mm-hmm. see the logic in it. Um, Sometimes that's maybe more than someone wants to do if they're, if they're kind of getting really frazzled by their whole insomnia thing and it's just taking over their life and all of that. They might need definitely more of like a coaching aspect, um, a real structured CBTI uh, program. But if they're interested in the app, absolutely. That, I it's helpful, like that. Um, I would say that's the main thing. It's just, you know, kind of it politely letting them know they probably haven't heard or read everything. And if they, if they kind of have, they might not, they might not have had it explained in a way that it's implemented properly. Um, I guess that's how I'd answer that question. Yep. I think I would agree with you. Um, a, a lot of people just feel like they've tried everything. Um, and I'll ask them if they've tried CBTI and they'll, they'll say, what's that? I think partly that's the community's fault for not spreading the word about CBTI more. Um, and a lot of people go to their doctors and their doctors won't even mention CBTI, you know, so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of sharing these techniques and helping people recognize that there, there is a solution out there that works for the overwhelming majority of people. Like if you go through a course of CBTI that's implemented correctly and implemented consistently, it would be really unusual for you not to be able to get your sleep back on track. I couldn't agree more. A lot of doctors are in a hard place because even the ones that are aware of it, um, they don't have the time to go through it with their patients. And also they may, they may not have anyone to refer them to. Um, but then again, at the same time, there are some doctors out there who aren't familiar with CBTI, you know, and so they'll encourage their patients to implement sleep hygiene um, and if that doesn't work, then maybe the next step is like the, is the sleeping pills, you know, and as we know that they're not a long-term solution. Right. If, in my opinion, if a CBTI program doesn't get into bedtime restriction and stimulus control early on, it's probably not an effective program. Um, there's obviously education that has to be done initially. There's got to be some basic understandings of certain things, you know, maybe your natural sleep drive, your circadian rhythm, you know, some things like that that kind of have to be clarified early on, but then it's really, it needs to jump into the core components quickly, I think, for someone to really realize a lot of benefit from the program. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, thanks for sharing your time with us and um, talk, talking to me about this today. If, if anyone wants to know more about you, what you do, or wants to download your app, where can they find you and where can they find your app? So the easiest thing is just to go to my website, which is sleep on Q and that's the letter Q.com um, where there's links to everything. There's links to the, the app store, to the Google play store um, and uh, an FAQ about the app. So um, they can read more about it and there's links to the, the intensive sleep retraining research. Um, and then there's a contact me page. I don't really have a blog going or anything like that. I, I'm on Twitter a fair amount. Um, and, uh, but everything is really, it, it is, it's focused around the website, which is sleep on Q, like letter Q.com. And I did do recently a three uh, episode series on the app itself. So it's actually good timing. If you look, the last three episodes I've done are all on the app. That's great. All right. Well, th thanks again for your time, Michael. It's been a re really interesting discussion and I hope it's given people a lot of things to consider listening to this. Um, and really, my, my ultimate goal is really just to give people hope that they can sleep, that there are ways to improve sleep and that they don't need to live with insomnia forever. Absolutely. And your Insomnia Coach website has been a huge part of that. It's, it's, it, it's immensely informative and everything that you're doing with CBTI is really, really helpful. So everyone go to Martin's website, insomniacoach.com. I also want to make sure to recognize the research team at Flinders University in Australia who did the original research, um, were very supportive and helpful. Uh, with my Sleep on Q app in providing a pilot study uh, for its validation for recognizing sleep onset. And also to um, let you know that they have their own device for doing at-home intensive sleep retra retraining called the THIM device, T-H-I-M, like Mary. And you should definitely check it out. Um, their website is thim.io. So if you go to thim.io, you can read all about um, their device for doing at-home intensive sleep retraining. Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia CBTI techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with unlimited support and guidance and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. I will teach you and help you implement new CBTI techniques over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice. And we come up with an initial two week plan that will have you implementing CBTI techniques that will lead to long term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email based support and guidance for two weeks after the call along with a half hour follow up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and as always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep. <laughs>